here I am sitting at this table with one of my heroes. <laughs> Seriously, really appreciate you, Michael. You're one of the best and most compassionate people that I know. And I'm so, so happy that humans and non-human animals have you on their side. Could you tell us a little about your work in NASA? Because I know that uh, your background was actually astronomy. Indeed, I minored in astronomy during my pre-med years at the University of Illinois. Love the nighttime sky. I'm I still, when I walk out at night, my eyes immediately go up, see who's up there and what's happening. And it's nice to be oriented as far as where you are and planet Earth and the stars let you do that. <laughs> and. Uh, we, I learned um, about the planets and uh, the astronomy instructor says if you walk outside tonight and look up to the east, um, there's going to be a bright planet Mars and Jupiter right next to each other. I went out and there they were, just where he said and I, I understand this now, so it was great to understand how the, how the solar system works. So I've been very fond of uh, the whole astronomical field. How I got involved with NASA was uh, through the nutrition door. Uh, in 1985 or six, I wrote a little book, a little nutrition guide, Vegan Nutrition Pure and Simple. Uh, it was a glorified handout for my patients that grew into a little book. Uh, and very useful and seemed to have helped a lot of people. At the same time, little did I know, uh, back at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, NASA is planning uh, to put uh, long-term space colonists on the moon and then on Mars. Well, if you're going to do that, you've got to feed them something. And it turns out that the laws of physics and economics state that to put anything, one pound of anything, water, brick, anything, in low Earth orbit, cost $16,000 a pound of anything. Well, it didn't take them long to realize that at $16,000 a pound, they're not going to be rocketing 800-pound dairy cows up to the moon uh, and feed them 80-pound bales of hay. It gets to be very expensive yogurt. And so they realized, much to their uh, shock, amazement, horror, their astronauts, their cosmonauts are going to have to be vegan. And they had no idea what to feed a human being uh, and totally, and totally on a plant-based diet, it, whether it's even possible. But the physics of it just dictate that. Well, it turns out that one of the NASA engineers uh, had an interest in plant-based nutrition and someone gave him my little book on vegan nutrition. And a week later, I get a phone call from NASA saying, Dr. Clapper, uh, we hear you know something about plant-based nutrition. Uh, we really need a crash course in it. Uh, can we fly you down here to Houston and can you talk to us about running a human body on plant-based foods? Well, when your country calls, you can't say no, uh, I'm too busy. And so I um, got on a plane and next thing I knew I was at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. For two weeks I was there and sat down with their engineers and their nutritionists and their soil scientists and their flight engineers uh, about growing food in space. And, uh, and we did an analysis of which foods are going to give you the most calories and the most protein density for how much water, etc., and how can you cycle the water. And it was fascinating and exciting. And uh, after two weeks, uh, they got it. Uh, they, they, we, we had come up with some menus. Uh, we found that potatoes, sweet potatoes, white potatoes seemed to be you know, a, a real staple there. And, uh, and they said, Doc, we'll take it from here. And they, they bring in their, their high-tech uh, uh, minions there and engineers. And I uh, went home, I spent, uh, I stayed in touch with them for another few months. Uh, but now every time the International Space Station goes over, I know they're growing greens up there. Uh, I always wait, I know where they're going over there. And, uh, and then when I saw that movie, The Martian, and I watched uh, Matt David grow potatoes there, I, I walked yes. up, you're welcome, Matt. <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, so that was my, uh, <clears throat> my uh, involvement with NASA. And uh, for whatever tiny little contribution I made, I'm glad that I could bring uh, plant-based nutrition into that uh, worthy program there. They're still vegan up there. Yeah, and be one more reason that there are no dairy cows in uh, international space. Station. Absolutely, no moves in space, no. Yeah, that reminded me of, you know, when they called Houston, like, Houston, we have a problem. Right. And it sounds like, you know, almost like a calling to Earth, like, Houston, we have a 
problem here, <laughs> not just space, but also here. <laughs> Indeed. You mentioned uh, dairy. Something I think in your story, which is very inspiring, I think is that uh, you grew up in a dairy farm. Mm -hmm. I'm from Iran and, you know, I was 22 years old and uh, when I really learned about like nutrition, how animals were treated, how the fact that I didn't even need animal products to, to survive. But I think the cognitive dissonance and misinformation is like so bad that I remember growing up, my mom was like, uh, you have to eat the bone marrow. In, in my culture, that's a thing Like we, yep. you know, cook, you know, big bones and just like you smash them against yep. a spoon and just because my mom was like, if you want to make blood, that's how I don't, I don't know where the logic comes from because like blood cells are made in bone marrow. Are, so if right, you eat them, yeah. that's how it works. I don't that's know. That's right. Uh, and if you eat brains, <laughs> you, brains, you get smarter. Yeah, crazy. You mentioned that. I mean, things that became so normalized for me to eat, uh, you know, there were like actual brain, actual cow's tongue. Your story also really resonates with me because you have that background uh, coming from like a dairy farm. Uh, and now you talk about, you know, how bad dairy is. So uh, tell me a little more about that. And I want to also learn more about the day that you actually went vegan, because I think it was in medical school around that time. I was a resident in, right. in anesthesiology, yes. I spent my first 16 summers on my uncle's dairy farm in, in northern Wisconsin. Uh, during the 50s, every summer the polio epidemics would come through the big cities. And so my parents uh, would get a, my brother and I out of, the, out of Chicago up, up to Wisconsin, where my, where my mother's uncle had a farm. We had 49 cows up there. And so since I was a little boy, but certainly by the time I was 8, 9, 10, I'm milking cows and I get the cows every morning and we milk them. It was an active dairy operation. and. I'm an eight, nine, ten-year-old kid. I was not for me to question, but certain things would happen there that really made me upset and concerned. Now, every time I walked in the barn, there was an air of sadness in the dairy barn, and and I would look at some of these magnificent cows in the stanch there, and they had big tears running down their their eyes there, and I didn't understand that. Now I understand that. In order to keep the milk flowing, you've got to keep making the cows pregnant. I remember we would lock the cow up and call the guy from Badger Breeders, and he'd come out and ram this bull semen up into the cow's uterus, and no cow like that. And then when the, she would carry her calf for nine months, finally give birth to a 65-pound baby, if you could imagine. The next morning, my uncle would come and scoop the calf up and put the calf in the veal pen 10 yards away. And... That poor mother cow, for the next days, would spend hour after hour bellowing the most heart-rending, soul-tearing moos and cries. Her baby was 10 yards away in the veal pan. She can't get to him. And I, I, I can still hear those sounds. It's the most painful auditory memory I have. And uh, far be it for me to ask my uncle, what, what's going on here? I thought, yeah, well, it's just uh, calves in the barn. That's all I knew. Now I realize that uh, to keep that milk flowing, you've got to keep taking those calves away from the mothers. And those big tears were real, though these, every cow in that barn was a new mother who just had a baby taken away from her. And I realized at that point the dairy barn. And then when a couple of the cows got old, my uncle would call the, the slaughterhouse folks and the guy with the truck would come by and um, he'd shoot the cow in the head and hang her up and, and bleed her out and then throw the carcass in the truck. And I realized the dairy barn is just a short stopping off place on the way to the slaughterhouse uh, for a few years of calves and milk uh, from these cows. And then they all wind up as hamburger, um, literally. When they slaughter the cow, after five years, eight years, they would live 25 years, but no cow lives 25 years. They kill them off in five, five years and when their milk production goes down. Um, because the flesh of dairy cows isn't as appetizing in the case of any meat is appetizing in the meat case. So they grind it up into ground beef. And people don't realize when they walk into the burger place and order their Big Mac or their Whopper, what they're eating is ground up old dairy cows <laughs> in there. It's the end of the fast food restaurant is the end of the line for the dairy industry. And, you know, and as, when you see that, where the conveyor belt really begins with these baby calves, Every male calf is kept in a pen for 16 weeks and they have the throat cut 
and, and sold as milk-fed veal. And the mother and the female calves wind up as four-legged milk pumps like their mother. And this is the dairy industry, and they all wind up getting their throats cut and turned into hamburger. And uh, uh, but when you're 10 years old, I don't realize that. But boy, you sure do now. And uh, and I don't want to support it in any possible way. And I realize, as an ardent feminist what an insult this is to the female of the species. We lock those female creatures up, we forcibly impregnate them, we, we take their babies away, we milk them, we slaughter them. And ironically, it's to the female human women that dairy products are sold the heart. You need it for your bones, you need that calcium, no osteoporosis, eat your yogurt, drink your milk. And ironically, every time they you, you put your dollar down for the Parmesan cheese or the, uh, or the Greek yogurt, you're saying to the dairy industry, uh, take another calf away from its mother, you know, cut another mother's throat. Uh, and uh, if people knew, yeah, especially nowadays, there's so much else to pour on your cereal, the rice milk, oat milk, hemp milk, almond milk, pick a, pick a plant milk, but uh, it's so needless today, and it, what it does to the environment, to the animals, it, it's one of those things that, one of those, like whaling, you know, we got to put it in the dustbin of history. We can't believe we used to do that. Ooh, not going to do that anymore. And that's what needs to happen to the dairy industry. So I don't have a great fondness for it. I've got a real antipathy uh, for, regarding dairy parts because it's sold as this happy cow, benign product. Ooh, you don't have to kill the cow to get the milk. Yes, you do. Talk about the big lie. Uh, the, the, the idea that animal, that like you and I were both sold as kids, that animal products are needed for health at all is the big lie. But then there's all those sub lies, dairy is good for your bones and you don't have to kill the cow. More lies, it's just founded on lies. So nice to be free of that. I'm so glad that you bring this to the conversation, like coming from like a actual dairy farm that a lot of people might say, oh, that's that local friendly farmer, right? That That's a kind of farm you're talking about and you know at the end of the day all animals in these farms whether it's chickens or cows the moment they're no longer profitable and people say oh no these farmers care and I'm like if they are if they are a business what is the primary motivation behind any business right so the moments that caring for animals get in the way of making money which one do you think any I think they would be a stupid businessman if they like cared for an animal welfare wouldn't be in business very long. And especially when you look at the branding of these industries and animal products, it's always a happy cow. It's always, and I'm like, no cow is happy when you're taking their baby away. No, no animal. Who is happy when they're like hanged upside down, you're cutting their throat? And you, you nailed it. Um, you know, I called myself like a human rights activist. Back in Iran, I almost got killed in a protest for human rights. And yet I was you know, supporting dairy. And honestly, I don't know if there is any industry that is as abusive as dairy is to females of other species. And that's why I really think of dairy as the biggest scam in the world because one industry has convinced the planet that nothing bad happens with milk. Like animals are not dying. What are you talking about? And not only that, but also you have 60 70 percent of human population not being even able to digest lactose and i'm like as a baby we all digest lactose that's a clear indication you're supposed to have milk human milk and the fact that we lose that ability we don't express uh, lactase uh, the expression level goes down because we are if that's not nature's way to say that you're not supposed to have milk, I don't know what is. I think Milton Mills uh, has a point when he says, you're not lactose intolerant, you're normal, you're not supposed to have lactose. And of course, Caucasians, you know, they had to have milk for survival, you know, many years ago, so they acquired a mutation that allows them to tolerate it, which doesn't, you know, give them immunity against like health problems as associated with uh, dairy consumption. Another problem that I see a lot is, um, oh, don't worry, we should have these animal products now that we should have them, which is false. Let's treat these animals like humanely and, you know, compassionately. I have a lot of problem there, honestly, because I generally ask people to define humane. Most people can't, but I tell them, I pull it up on my phone and I say humane means act of compassion and kindness. An example of killing an animal compassionately is 
Like when your dog is old and sick and you put them down, you're crying, it's like because you're doing it, you want to be kind and nice to that animal, you're trying to reduce their suffering. But when you like kill a chicken, kill a healthy animal who wants to live because you like the taste of their bodily secretions or body parts, that is anything but uh, compassion. My introduction to this, a lot of this as a food scientist, so I studied pandemics, antibiotic resistance, and a lot of other like uh, public health issues. And right now we have a bird flu going on. And if you go to CDC, you see that the bird pandemic that we have is caused by not just factory farms, but also local farms. So all those local, happy, humane farms, quote unquote, they still contribute to pandemics, still contribute to um, antibiotic resistance. What do you think about that? The, you know, when you go to grocery stores, you see all this grass-fed, organic, cage-free. Uh, I think they spend a lot of money paying marketing people to come up with these phrases to soothe our consciences and make us feel better. Uh, sustainable is another one. But the reality is it's marketing and, uh, and it is just ways to, that we can sop our conscience so we don't feel so bad. Paul McCartney said that you know, if slaughterhouses had glass walls, we'd all be vegetarian. And, and this is a way to uh, keep you from looking into the glass wall slaughterhouse. Um, yeah. Well, it's sustainable, it's humane, it's free range. It's, uh, but the fact is they're all atrocities. And uh, these are living creatures who have a right to live out their own lives. And we steal that from them on, on every level. And we co-opt their lives uh, and put them in these dreadful conditions, whether they're cows, pigs, chickens, whatever. Uh, and then we end their lives. Um, there's nothing humane about that. Uh, in slavery, you've stolen these people's lives. They were on their way to you know, raise their children. They got hijacked onto a boat, and now they're picking cotton with a guy with a gun standing over. You've stolen their lives from them. There's nothing good about slavery. Well, the same thing with, with the animal situation. Uh, these animals want to be out in the sunshine raising their young, um, and here we, we steal everything from them and degrade them. So uh, no, the idea of humane conditions, by definition, it's an oxymoron, it just, you just can't be given. You, you want to love an animal, bring him up to your lap and snuggle a little bit. Uh, you know, that's how you be humane to an animal, not by eating their flesh. Yeah, it, so these just marketing lies that we just use to f make ourselves feel better. And I always say, you know, you can do something that is inherently wrong, like killing a person for no reason. You can do it painlessly, but just because you did it painlessly doesn't mean that that killing is justified. So maybe there are better or worse ways to kill an animal, but there is no right way when you don't have to. And I think that's really a key. I'm honestly, a lot of times when I talk about benefits of whole food plant-based diet, I try not to talk about animals. At least I have that tendency because I'm like, are people going to think that, you know, we are biased because we care for animals? But I think the truth is, I think we became vegan despite our bias. We grew up, you know, consuming animal products. You know, I didn't become vegan because I hated the taste of meat. It was like going against the flow in society and we did something different. You know, no one really wants to be in, you know, minority at least for now. But against that bias, we became vegan. And I think it's something like, you know, doctors used to smoke and, you know, some, at some point that someone says, Maybe let's look at the data. It's not good for health and, you know, maybe we shouldn't be doing that. You're not calling that doctor biased because now he's like trying to get everyone not to smoke. When I look at, you know, every major cancer institute, they all say the less meat, the better, like without exception. One of my jobs as a biomedical scientist used to be purifying antibodies for um, influenza, COVID, and a couple of other infectious diseases. I actually brought this syringe with me. These guys are endotoxin free or pyrogen free, right? Because anything that comes in contact with you know, our blood needs to be endotoxin free. Endotoxin, as you know, are parts of gram negative bacteria. And when they end up in our blood, our body really thinks it's infection um, and you know basically flares up our immune system to to combat it and these are not live bacteria so this thing could be sterile 
but even with the sterilization, you can't get rid of endotoxins. So these are just leftovers of bacteria you can't get rid of with cooking. And it's really interesting to me because in animal products, especially meat, you have a high amount of endotoxins just from the way that animals are slaughtered and coming in contact with feces and all that. So to begin with, you have a lot of endotoxins. Another thing, endotoxins are lipopolysaccharides. So from one side, they're lipid. From the other side, they're sugar. So when you basically eat endotoxins, it's nothing, right? So I can like lick my finger and I get endotoxins. It goes to my GI tract and I'm fine. The problem starts when they go from my intestine to my bloodstream, which is why we don't need to be worried about this thing to be endotoxin free. But if it's for injection, if this is not endotoxin free, the endotoxins will cause inflammation. That's, that's a well-known fact. So not only meat and other animal products are high in, in endotoxins to begin with, the saturated fat kind of uh, acts as a career to dissolve endotoxins and pass them through to our blood. And that causes inflammation and plaque formation and etc. And on the other hand, something that is really crazy is that what actually prevents this is fiber. Who knew? <laughs> So not only eating plants uh, reduces the amount of endotoxin to begin with, but also it prevents them from like getting into our bloodstream. And to top that off, saturated fat and animal products change the diversity of gut microbiome towards more gram-negative bacteria. So you are also increasing the amount of gram-negative bacteria and endotoxins that you have in your gut. I love this example because it's like as if nature is orchestrating this entire thing to tell you are not supposed to have animal products. But uh, that's only one aspect of it. I, I used to be a cancer researcher, just the way that meat can cause cancer and uh, also cardiovascular diseases is something I'm very interested in. And uh, I know you know a lot about that. Right. I first ran into endotoxin when I was a resident in the intensive care unit and these people were dying of endotoxic shock. And I had to learn about it. And it turns out, as you said, uh, especially in our diet, that all animals pass through the slaughterhouse, even grass-fed organic beef. And as the, as the carcass is being eviscerated, as, they, as the guts are pulled out, it's inevitable you get spillage of the gut bacteria uh, all over the slaughterhouse cutting surfaces. You can take a culture tube and swab any cutting surface uh, in the slaughterhouse, and you'll get a luxurious growth of E. coli, salmonella, Shigella, Enterococcus, Pseudomonas, the whole rogues gallery of enteric bacteria. And every steak, every chicken breast, every turkey wing that leaves the, the meatpacking plant has a covering of these bacteria. Uh, they're wrapped in uh, plastic and sent to your local supermarket. And in the meat case, the ultraviolet light shines down, kills the bacteria, and they break apart. And as they do, their cell walls uh, release this lipopolysaccharide called endotoxin. Nasty stuff. Makes your blood clot, releases histamine, releases free radicals, depresses your heart function. Nasty stuff. Uh, and it makes your gut leaky. It increases intestinal permeability. And so food proteins and bacteria start leaking out in the bloodstream. The complement of the endotoxin. Uh, and as you said, it's heat stable. Grilling the burger does yep. not get rid of the endotoxin. It, it, it's on there. And our paleo friends and our carnivore friends are giving themselves a shot of endotoxin three times a day. What is that doing to their gut wall and to their intestinal permeability? Uh, it's another sign, as you're saying, from the animal uh, that, uh, uh, you know, when you make oatmeal, you don't generate endotoxin. You know, when you steam broccoli, you don't uh, no, generate endotoxin. It's another message from life and the animals that we're not supposed to be eating the flesh of these creatures. And uh, no matter how you look at it, it's a very active cooking animal muscle. Oxidizes the cholesterol in the animal's muscle. And it's the oxidized cholesterol particles that get into the walls of the arteries and sort off the plaque formation. Every time you you grill a, a burger or, a, a, or fry a chicken, you create carcinogenic cancer-causing substances that smear on the stomach lining, you get gastric cancer, it smears on the colon lining, you get colon cancers. Uh, it's uh, toxic, evil stuff, no matter how you look at it. And no matter what the mighty hunter legend played, and it doesn't matter, that it turned the page on that one, it's who we, what we used to do. Same thing with fishing, where we've strip mined the oceans, we're clear cutting the oceans with these massive nets. We've used fishing up, we've used it up. 
let the oceans heal at this point. And the same thing with the land and the animals that stop killing everything. And you can't, we can't kill our way out of disease, out of, out of poverty, out of environmental destruction. That's the problem, not the solution. Now we need to foster life in our food choices and everything else we do. Well, we have dominion over the earth. Dominion comes from the same root as domicile, your home, your house. They're guests in your house. Protection. We're, we're here to protect these animals. That We're the keepers of the garden. You don't plunder your garden, you care for it, you take care of it. The same thing with the animals and the plants and the oceans. We're here to take care of them. So it's time to do that figure ground reversal. Yeah. That, you know, what are we doing here? We're the caretakers, you know, are, are we? And starting with our food choices, that's the number one thing to do. When you're in that restaurant with that menu in front of you, when you're pushing that cart down the supermarket aisle, those are the two times when you can make a really positive statement for life there. Because every time you're in the restaurant and you turn to the wait person and say, I'll have the beef, I'll have the chicken, I'll have the veal, every time you say those words, your children, your grandchildren's world gets a little hotter and a little drier and a little deader. It really makes a difference. Every time you choose the plant option, the world gets a little greener and a little suffering goes down a little bit. It really does matter. Plus, you'll be healthier for it. So uh, every choice makes a difference. Make every choice affirming uh, uh, life and healing on this planet. Yeah, I think something that is going on right now is this carnivorous diet and men really feeling like they're super strong and, uh, you know, that masculinity issues that some people have and they kind of almost want to compensate by eating more meat because there is like somehow association between murdering animals and looking mas masculine. Yes, somehow, you know, talk about toxic masculinity. Yeah, there's no more powerful, potent, frightening manifestation of toxic masculinity than th that directed to, uh, you know, th that caveman image that, ah, I'm a caveman, I eat meat, you know, let me kill something and tear its flesh. One, it turns out that's a, that's a myth. Uh, the, when they examine what the, the Paleolithic people really ate, the vast majority of calories that came into the Paleolithic camp were gathered by the women who spent all day digging up roots and tubers. We were starch eaters then. We we're starch eaters now. Starches uh, provided the majority of calories. Most hunts were unsuccessful. Most times the guys came back empty-handed from hunting. Or didn't come back. Or didn't come back. <laughs> And if they did drag a carcass into camp, it rotted within days. There's no refrigeration. This idea that you know every caveman had a mastodon in the freezer and spent all day eating mammoth meat. I'm a caveman. That's what I do. It's nonsense. We were starchivores then, and we are starchivores now. I mean, we were starch eaters uh, back then. So, the, so the, uh, the reality is that the whole image is, is wrong. You know, we can talk about the uh, unjust uh, aspect of it at all. If these people really had to go out and kill the animal and butcher it themselves, uh, there'd be a lot fewer meat eaters. It's a lazy uh, way to, to nourish yourself and destroy the earth along the way. As a physician and someone who cares about the earth, the major issues are certainly what large-scale animal agriculture is doing to planet earth. It is the number one driving force to a global warming, cutting down the forest, um, the uh, soil erosion, uh, pick an environmental disaster. Our voracious appetite for animal flesh is driving the animal in production industry that's driving all this environmental destruction. It, it's us. We've met the enemy and they is us as far as the environment goes in our environmental future. But as a physician, I'm looking at these guys eating meat, 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 and I'm thinking, what are they doing to their arteries, walls? What are these guys are setting themselves up for an epidemic? of strokes and heart attacks. What are they doing to their gut flora? Um, they are spawning microbes down there that are that erode into the gut wall. They're going to get colitis and Crohn's disease. If you want to set off a colon cancer, I don't know a better way to do it than pack a colon full of meat three times a day and let that rub on the colon wall. It's a high-fat diet. It clogs up your insulin receptors and sets you up for type 2 diabetes. When you cook the meat, nobody eats raw meat. When you cook the meat, you create these advanced glycation end products um, that damage the arteries in the brain. Uh, these five guys are setting themselves up for a vascular dementia, and they think they're doing something mm, you know, life-affirming for themselves. The fact is they're setting themselves up for an epidemic. 
of um, colon cancer, autoimmune disease, type 2 diabetes, um, heart attacks, strokes, uh, and Alzheimer's disease. And then they say, well, you gotta die of something, doc. Get my heart attack and die. Now, Mother Nature's got some tricks up a sleeve. I've been a physician for five decades. The worst thing in medicine is to get a stroke and not die and spend your next 20 years in a wheelchair or drooling with some pretty nursey wiping your backside because you can't reach back there with one hand. Mm, takes the romance out of a marriage, to say the least there. Uh, and, uh, or get your heart attack and not die, but you lose two-thirds of your heart muscle, so you get out of breath and walk into the mailbox. Your world gets pretty short there, macho man. When I hear these guys saying, well, you gotta die of something, um, uh, I, I hope that uh, uh, they don't encounter uh, some uh, very painful manifestation of that. So again, talk about toxic masculinity. It's so short-sighted. All they want, you know, they're focused on the taste of that steak in their mouth. That's, that's the bottom line. Like these corporations, what's our bottom line earning? That's all they're focused on. What's that? I got a piece of steak in my mouth. I'm a macho guy. Um, but the cost of that um, to, to them, to the planet, to the animals, to their health, um, is beyond measure, and we're all paying the price for it as the earth is getting warmer, hotter. So the whole meat-eating thing was a big blind alley. We're going to look, you know, the way we literally look at slavery now, that that was, that was a bad move. You know, look at, we're still paying the, the echo, price for the echoes of that horrible mistake. Let's kidnap a bunch of black people and bring them over here and have them work on a Wrong. Don't do that. If you're back in history, you'd, you'd want to grab. Don't do that. That where that leads, you you don't want to know. Well, they say let's kill and eat a bunch of animals. Let's raise a bunch of animals and cut their. You don't do that. That's going to take you to places you don't want to go. So we we need to understand both of those and uh, see we to back out of that. Okay. Uh oh. Okay. Well, we see the, that that was a mistake. Let, what do we do? Oh, eat plants. Oh, you have a bean chili instead of beef chili. Oh, we can do that. That's all you gotta do. You know, that's all that's being asked. And it would change everything. And the forest would come back and the soils would stabilize and the rivers would run clear and we would live long and healthy and wouldn't have this epidemic of strokes and Alzheimer's. The message is clear, what the animals have been saying all along. You know, don't eat us. Yeah, I love animals, love us, don't eat us. You know, and that's what it comes down to, which is your message as well. And just to Finish, I, I really appreciate that you included chickens and fish in your example because I think that's a major issue as people are more aware of red meat, they are moving to chicken and fish. And there is like some really shitty studies out there when they like compare like fish and chicken and they're like, oh, you know, the cholesterol level didn't uh, change or whatever. But you look at the way a study was done, you look at who funded the studies, it's like flawed studies ignore the fact that, you know, uh, even, you know, fish still uh, has uh, cholesterol, has a lot of heavy metals. And at the end of the day, it could be healthier than red meat, sure. But why are we even going that route when you have so many other wonderful, healthier uh, options? Yeah. And it really hurts me to know that just, you know, as people do that, even more chickens and more fish uh, die. And I think it's a real problem because those animals are a little farther away from us, so people don't sympathize or empathize as much with those animals, which means that we kill like over a trillion marine animals, and that includes also you know bycatch, dolphins, and which is really funny when people say, "Oh, I'm not gonna have like a plastic straw, um, you know, to save fish," but they don't really stop eating fish to save fish, which is always funny. Um, so they say, oh, I love fish. No, you love to eat fish. You don't love fish. If you love them, you let them swim and live their lives there. No, you love to eat fish and we're running out of fish. I think a lot of excuses that people have, um, the, the root cause of it is just they, like to, they just like the taste. Like if they hated the taste of meat, they would not be here saying that, oh, lions eat meat, that's why I'm doing that, right? It's important to just educate people that there are just like so many good options and their alternative is not like eating salads, basically. Absolutely. Um, no matter what the arguments are supposedly perched upon as far as uh, protein uh, intake and all that stuff, it's basically, come on, you like the taste of flesh exactly. in your mouth. 
That's it. That's ultimately the only real, real reason you're really yeah. still eating the stuff. Okay, let's not, because you can get everything else. You want protein, you know, plenty in beans and lentils. It's not, let's not, let's call it for what it really is. And it's, and it's the saddest of rationalizations. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill you and eat you because I like the way your flesh tastes. <laughs> yeah, we, we can do better than that. Yeah, and I think uh, it's a lot easier for like social media influencers to get, um, you know, followers if they just validate what people, everyone wants validation, right? Mm -hmm. So if you tell them, oh, the meat you are eating is perfectly fine, you know, go, go for it. I, of course, people love to hear that. What people don't want to hear is the truth that, you know, there is a better way to move for, forward. No one is shaming you. You're just saying that there is a better way to move forward. I changed. I thought it was hard. I did it. You can too. I get it. We don't want to change. Uh, we are evolutionary, like evolved not to want to change. Uh, we, we like habits, but like putting ourselves in place of animals, I think is a big factor. Just thinking about their suffering and knowing that it's always easier for us to change our dietary habits than someone else to, to die. I think that's really helpful. And also understand that it's all in our head. Like vegan food can be tasty. Recently, I've also been thinking that when we talk about diet, I think people just think about like what we eat. But I think it's just when you talk about diet, it's like there are a lot more considerations. In theory, I could eat you um, and that would be a part of my diet. But we know that that's not how it works because now there is someone else involved, right? So when, when it comes to our diet, it's not just what we eat. It's not just the nutrients that I put in my body, but it's also the impact that it has in other people's lives, in other animals. And I think that should actually should be a part of the conversation. You know, I'm so tired of just like leaving animals out because I think people may say, I care about animals and that's why I'm like pushing this. But the truth is all that matters. I think sometimes we get really caught up with this mechanism of action of, you know, this food versus that food. But the truth is we know clearly, like I've been vegan for 11 years. How many years have you been vegan? 1981, 43 years now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how old are you? I'm 76. 76? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and I genuinely mean that. You are one of the sharpest people I've ever seen. Uh, seriously, like, you know, we bring you to medical schools to talk about whole food plant-based diet. I see things go wrong and you handle them right there you know, in, in your last presentation. The presentation didn't come up and your memory is just having that presence of mind in your age and just like being vegan for you know almost 50 years all we need to know is that you can be healthy you can be happy you can have a compassionate and fun life without you know killing animals without causing pandemics without causing a lot of suffering it's so easy to get seduced about uh, the individual components uh, you need this much protein, you need this vitamin, you need the... And people have all sorts of squabbles about uh, these various components, and many of them come from the animals, so it's, always, it's okay to eat this part of the, the liver and the brains and the eyeballs or whatever. But it gets down to the, uh, the beautiful concept that Dr. Colin Campbell uh, expressed in one of his latest books called Whole, W-H-O-L-E. And he warned us, don't get pulled in down these rabbit holes of this vitamin, this mineral, this component. It's the whole food stream moving through you. In my slide presentation, I show a picture of a mountain gorilla with a bunch of leaves in his mouth. He said, this animal eats a high fiber, high carbohydrate all diet all day, just shoveling leaves and fruit and vegetation into his mouth. They don't develop clogged arteries, they don't develop high blood pressure, they don't develop colitis. It's their natural diet. They are plant-eating hominids, as are we. We've got basically the same digestive system that the gorillas and the bonobos do. It's the whole food stream that that makes the difference, including whether there was violence attached, whether it was blood, whether there's environmental destruction, whether the, everything that you, you consume, you consume and, and cause it to be produced there. And when we look at the environmental cost, at the, uh, at the suffering cost uh, that an animal-based diet inflicts, again, that, that whole food stream has become toxic. It, always, it kind of always was, but it's wor worse now. We are plant-eating hominids. And as the further we get away from that, and as soon as we start eating a bunch of meat and cheese and oils and sugars and salt and all of that, it's like putting diesel fuel in a gasoline burning engine and, uh, and the machinery clogs up to say the least. And also when people say like, 
carnivorous diet and stuff. I compiled a list of cancer centers and institutes that talk about like meat. And they often like consider not just red meat, but also any kind of meat, uh, sometimes include dairy too. But they all basically say the less meat, the better or drop it completely, right? There is no cancer center that says, you know, eat a lot of meat. You know, the more meat you eat, the better. It's just a ridiculous the amount of evidence. And also when it comes to like endorsing whole food plant-based diet, it's not just vegans. It's, you see like uh, Kaiser, you see Mayo Clinic, you see like uh, a lot of other non-vegan organizations, they all say that whole food plant-based diet is healthful and it's uh, sufficient for all stages of life, including pregnancy and uh, for athletes. What really hurts me as a scientist is that I used to be a cancer researcher and one day my dream was to reduce the number of deaths from cancer by 1% and I knew if I do that I'd probably get a Nobel Prize. It's not that I ever wanted to get a Nobel Prize but I really wanted to have that kind of impact and save, save people. That's the whole idea I became like a biomedical scientist. But it was very disappointing when I learned that 40% of cancers can be prevented not just by whole food plant based diet but lifestyle changes. Uh, and worse than that, number one cause of death is not cancer. So even if I wanted to save the most number of people, I should focus on cardiovascular diseases, which is almost entirely preventable, and then all other chronic diseases. Which is why with Allied Scholars, my nonprofit, I really try to bring this education to universities. Not only make more people aware and vegan, but also generate more people like yourself who can be such a vocal advocate for whole food plant-based diet. Which is why we really want to bring people like you and especially you to medical schools because we really want to train the future generation of healthcare professionals. Something that I'm really trying to do with my nonprofit is that these are not just like one talk here, one talk there, but it just gets incorporated into medical education. And I think PCRM Physicians Committee is doing a great job. American uh, College of Lifestyle Medicine is doing an amazing job. But they don't necessarily have the student group interested. So we work with a lot of undergrads, pre-med or whatever. And we kind of want to channel all of them into careers that they can use to advocate for uh, veganism and whole food plant-based diet. Um, so how was your experience coming to University of Texas uh, at Austin and talking to students? It was a wonderful experience. So just starting very beginning um, that you created the invitation. Uh, as I was pondering, I said, uh, Dr. Clapper, you're going to go talk to the University of Texas, the Longhorns of all people. Uh, and yet, the truth is so powerful, and there are seekers of truth who want to hear this message. And, and it needs to, even in the bowels of the beef country, they need to hear this message on some level. And the fact that, uh, that you created that opening was, was wonderful in itself. Uh, and it's a beautiful facility, and it was a really professionally done uh, event. I compliment you again for that. Uh, but a nice audience in there, uh, and they were interested. Nobody left uh, during the presentation. From the looks in their faces, I could hear that the, they were understanding the, the message here, uh, whether on a personal health level, on an animal welfare level, on the, uh, uh, or on the environmental level. I got some wonderful questions afterwards, uh, and a number of, uh, of uh, medical students and pre-med folks came up and said, thank you, I had no idea about any of this. You know, old saying from uh, the philosopher Goethe, you know, what you know about, you see. Yeah. And once you know about something, you start seeing it. And after that lecture, I know a whole bunch of young med students are going to see a whole lot more now when they go to their lectures or read their books. Let's hear it for the Longhorns. They were open enough, and let's hear it for you for arranging that, uh, to let that message in. And you can't unring the bell, you know. When, exactly. when, and so the, that message is in there. There are people who know about it or are talking about it. And I want them to ask their professors. I want them to, uh, to keep this alive. And uh, when they get out to... In medical clinics, they ask their, uh, their instructors, well, do you think this patient's diet had anything to do with their type 2 diabetes? Or their, uh, what are we going to do for, for this man with a hypertension? What are we going to tell him to eat? You know, bring clinical nutrition in uh, to the clinical practice because that's why the patient sitting in front of you, doctor, overweight, hypertensive, diabetic, clogged up and inflamed from what they are eating. And if you want to heal these people, get them on a plant-based diet and watch them transform their, their health. So it's exciting. I, I, I felt it was definitely a worthwhile trip to get, make that lecture. 
thank you. I really appreciate that. I think the whole point of my nonprofit is to make sure that this stays alive and mm -hmm. uh, we just don't do something that it just faints away. So we find those students who are motivated and really train the future generation of thought leaders and people who can become, you know, like yourself, like really influential people, not just you know, here is one lecture about nutrition. So we've been running into the similar phenomenon with our organization, Moving Medicine Forward. The medical profession is, in my mind, the main bottleneck uh, preventing this society-wide transformation to a whole food plant-based diet that needs to happen for every reason, health, environment, animals, etc. Uh, and my noble profession is a bottleneck. Now, the doctors never mention the patient's diet at the visits. They don't know anything about nutrition. They, uh, they, they don't get paid for it. They, it just is never mentioned at a visit. And they're all dealing with diet-based diseases. That's what the patient's sitting in front of them for. How do we break that log jam. With Moving Medicine Forward, we give them a, uh, uh, I give them my lecture, what I wish I learned in medical school about nutrition. Mm -hmm. But as you said, we don't want this to be a one-time drive-by lecture and, and the spark flares up and then it fades away. So we're a new organization, but we've just hired an outreach director and the program that we want to uh, develop is after I give my introductory lecture, our follow-up people contact the person who, the most nutritionally awake medical student or uh, faculty member, and, and say, well, what do you need to keep the spark alive here? Or do you need a once a month question and answer question, session with Dr. Clapper? Do you, how about a plant-based journal club where you bring in uh, uh, articles from the, from the medical journals regarding plant-based nutrition? How about a challenging case session where uh, you had trouble figuring out what's going on? Why would a plant-based person have a high cholesterol? Let's talk about that. Um, how about let's show some films. There's some infabulous documentaries coming out now and let's talk about that. What do you need to keep the flame burning here? And the beautiful part of this is once you get this happening on a monthly basis, the, the students and the residents talk about it to each other, but you can combine schools. You know, next, uh, next Thursday, the students from the University of Texas, University of Alabama, the University of Mississippi, and Kentucky State, we're all gonna be having a, a, a Q&A with Dr. Clapper. You know, there's ways we can um, magnify our reach. So it has to happen on that level until it becomes just exciting. Accepted. The people, of course, right. I ask my patients about what they're eating. Yeah, of course, I recommend plant-based diets. You know, my vision is what if every doctor at every visit, before you let the patient go, by the way, uh, what are you eating these days, Joe? Uh, how's your plant-based diet going? Uh, you, you know, I went plant-based last year, man, best thing ever did. I've got all of my pills. How are you doing? I, I really want you to get on with, the, with adopting a plant-based diet. What if every doctor said that to every patient at every visit, you know? How we would transform, oh, my doctor told me to go plant-based. Oh, yes, no, we're gonna try that. And uh, it's such an underused power that the doctors have, and I wanna shake them and say, use this. You wanna you want get your patients healthy? Get real about what they're eating, <laughs> absolutely. The way I look at diet is like littering or you know trashing a lot of people understand trashing or littering is wrong and they don't do it because they know it does something bad for everyone right it makes our environment dirty and they would go extra you know 100 feet to find a trash can despite the fact that it's just easier to trash right so you walk 100 feet to find a trash can why not taking one extra food to get that vegan option why not you know, take one extra food to bring whole food plant-based education to universities, to train students, to train the future health healthcare professionals. I think there is a big problem here and it's not getting enough attention. Yes, no, we both have to keep working away at it. I was a teenager in 1961 when the Berlin Wall came up. 1960s and 70s and 80s, we thought it was gonna be there forever, all barbed wire and machine guns and heavy duty guys back there. And that'll never come down. After 20 years of um, free trade and Beatles music and blue jeans, in 1989, in over a weekend, we watched that wall come down piece by piece, uh, you know, it was dismantled. And the same thing, I'm hoping, especially as the young people uh, realize, the, make that connection between that burger and the, and the destruction of the rainforest and the heating of the oceans. It's, all, it's from the meat we're eating. The, the flesh eating is killing us. We want to make meat eating as uncool as wearing fur or smoking cigarettes. Yes. 
So if a kid orders a burger, the, his friend say, are you still eating that stuff? Don't, don't you know what that does to your body, to the animals, to the plant, to our future? How can you do that? When that understanding starts spreading uh, through the professional community, the, the youth community, it may change like the Berlin Wall and suddenly, the, oh, did we really used to raise all those animals and kill them? Oh, that was a bad dream. So it, we might be closer than we think. It's despair or not, my friend. We, we gotta keep working and chipping away at that wall that eventually it'll come down and there'll be sunshine for all of us. There will be sunshine. Indeed. Thank you so much, Michael. Really appreciate that. Thank you. What, what are you drinking? Uh, this is watermelon juice. Mmm, <laughs> delicious. My wife squeezed it. Uh, let me feel this for the interview. Cheers. Cheers.